So if you're like me, you think that Twitter is kind of the cesspool of humanity, uh, just where the worst of the worst go. If you want to have an argument, if you want to ruin your day, you get on Twitter. And then I learned something really cool, that you can curate who you, who you read, who you follow on Twitter and make it a different experience. I found my next guest, he, was, uh, uh, he you know, talked about venture capitalism, talked about finance, but he also talked about life and he talked about spirituality and he talked about best practices and stoicism. And I loved listening to, to the wisdom that he brought to the business world. Uh, he's one of many on my Twitter feed that now feeds my soul when I actually open up the, the app. It's no longer the cesspool of humanity for me, it's what I made of it. Uh, so I, I've been following this young, you know, this young man and, and kind of marveling at how he shifted and changed his life kind of reminded me a little bit of myself and what I did. And I decided I needed to share him with you guys. So Steve Schlafman, hold on, I've got to put on my reading glasses. You guys know I'm old. So Steve Schlafman is a professional coach and the founder of High Output, a boutique uh, leadership training company. A part, he was, he came, comes from the venture capital world in New York City. He was a partner and a principal in many of the top firms. And uh, he left that world, sort of, because he believes that uh, entrepreneurs are the catalyst of change and have the power to shape the world. How is that for a powerful statement and a powerful why in life? So, Steve, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a while. So the whole point of it is, uh, you know, the whole, the, the whole New York finance scene and, and, you know, being in the 1% and just striving and striving and striving, uh, it's addictive and it's really hard to get out of the inertia of that, um, that lifestyle uh, of, the, of, of keeping up with, uh, with the people who are on the left and the right. And you made a shift at some point in your life. What, was the, what was the catalyst for that? What, what made you actually stop for a second and go, I need to go in a different direction? So it was, geez, what year was this? It was the summer of 2014. My wife and I had gone to France for her brother's wedding. And I'm in the middle of the south of France and I have my Kindle. And I just finished my book and I had no idea what I was going to read next. And I open up the, the store, like the virtual store, and I, and I get served an ad or a recommendation for the power of now. <laughs> and I basically devoured that book in the course of the next five to seven days. And it just completely knocked me on my ass. And I had this realization, among many others, that I had been living in the future. I had been seeking substances and money and, you know, all of these things. And as a result, I wasn't present and I wasn't really with who I, who I was as a person. And then that, that whole experience, literally the day I got home, I emailed my friend and I was like, you know, I really want to start meditating. Do you know any teachers? And she said, as a matter of fact, my best friend from San Francisco is coming to New York next week and she's a teacher. And so then the next week I went and I learned uh, Vedic, which is very similar to TM, effectively TM. And then that, that, that's what started me on this journey was that was literally getting served a recommendation for the power of now. Nothing, nothing like the teacher coming when you're ready, a recommendation, an ad to change your life. What knocked you off your, what knocked you off your feet from that book? Well, I had, and I'm, I'm open about this publicly, but I, I was a, a highly functioning addict as in an addiction runs in my family. But I remember like the, the mo first second I got high, I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And it sort of just like dumbed me. And then for almost 20 years, basically from the time I was 16, but it really started when I was 18, like as I got into college to 35, I basically smoked if not every day, almost every day to like numb me. And um, I was kind of dumb. Or I was kind of done living in this, this like numbed state. Like I wanted to actually be present. And, and honestly, that's what knocked me on my ass is that book made me realize that I had never really been living a present. And like, I, 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 I like to kid myself that I was like thoughtful <laughs> but I wasn't present. 
I absolutely wasn't present. And that's what knocked me on my ass. I just, it, it, it made me realize that there was a different way to live and a different way to be awake. And I was just like, I was also at a point in my life at that time, I didn't get sober until almost a year later, but I was just done living in this haze. Like, you know, this, like what I like to call this mental Novocaine as I was floating through the world in this like sleeping awake state. And I was like, okay, I'm ready to wake up. And, and it was also like my wife and I had been married. We, we'd been together almost eight years, but married for a year. And we knew that we were going to have kids in the future. And as someone who, um, who's both, both, both of my parents were, you know, struggled with substance abuse in different forms. Um, I was like, I want to be like, I, I want to make sure I'm present and I'm awake. So when we do have kids, like I've already done all this work for them. Yeah, that's amazing. So one, one of the reasons why we numb ourselves is, is so that we don't feel what happened, yeah. what happened when you actually stopped and you actually were, were present and had to have feelings and thoughts and, and deal with reality. Yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm still, and I, I mean this, like, I'm still, tr I'm still getting into my body mm. and my feelings. Like it's something I'm, I'm, conti I'm, I continue to work on, but it just like, I started like asking myself this question where I would like be sitting in a partner meeting on a Monday for four hours, like in our, you know, in, in, in at the venture capital fund that I was working at at the time. And I'm just like, what am I doing here? Right. Like I just started to like actually get in tune with my energy. I, now I have, a, I have a saying now that like energy management is more important than time management. And I just started to actually be a little bit more aware of like how I, how I feel. Like once I, like I was meditating twice a day, 20 minutes, whether I was like hungover, stoned. And so like at a certain point in time, you're like hungover and you're meditating and you're like, I fucking feel like shit. Like <laughs> right? this is, this is awful. Right. And, and then you're, you're like, Oh, like this thing actually is giving me, this thing's taking away energy. This is like, this activity makes me excited. Like, Oh, this is causing me stress and anxiety. Oh, I'm afraid of that. Like, and you start to like be able to construct a mental map of your life where you're like, okay, like now I think I can live a little bit more intentionally. And finally that took me the courage to be like, okay, I have a problem with substances. Like it's time to clean it up. And then I had to and say, Hey, look, like, it's not like our, our relationship is in shambles and I'm a mess, but like, Hey, I need to come out to you that I've been keeping some. And so like, there was this buildup but I think what, what happened was, is like, as I began to tune into my emotional state and my body in these, in, in energetic state and the activities that were feeding or robbing me of my energy, I was able to start to say, okay, like, how can I live a little bit more deliberately so that I can move closer? And at the time I didn't realize this, but instinctively like move closer to the person that like I'm meant to be. It's so interesting because you, you know, we can have, we ha we were talking before I turned on the mic that you can have a really successful life and look really good to everybody without actually living, uh, being in your life. Like not, you know. Oh yeah. I mean, I was a, I, I was a partner at a venture capital fund in New York, a, you know, billion and a half under management, making more money than I ever thought I would in my life. And I was just like, I, I did, I couldn't show a chink in my armor. Like I, I hid this from everybody, you know, in terms of like, you know, the, the frequency of which I would smoke and use of Adderall and other, other substances. Um, and it just, I wasn't happy. And finally I was just like, okay, something has to give, like, I'm either going to die young or I'm going to end up doing something that I regret. And I just, I, I don't want to go that way. Like, I, that's just not the life I want to have. Like I could feel, I could feel it growing in me. And what, what's interesting is when I like ultimately, and I use this word, like came out and got sober and spoke openly about it. Like most people had no idea that I was struggling with this. It's because everybody's paying attention to their own lives and struggling with whatever it is they're struggling with. 
it's just it's just rampant. Yeah. You know, we're we're all doing everything we can just to keep the wheels turning. Uh, whether or not you have substance abuse or not, mm -hmm. the stress. Uh, you know, I come from the high tech industry. The stress. You would you would think that we were brain surgeons and that everything was life and death, right? That every decision that we made, every choice we made, that we had to have our phones on twenty four seven when we were just selling technology. We weren't saving people's lives, uh, mm -hmm. but we had to act that way because it was yeah. just so, so pressure, such a pressure cooker. So now, now you, now you, mm -hmm. so by the way, thank you so much for being so candid with this. I really, when I, when I get guys like you who, you know, cause you don't talk about this, uh, yeah, in the day -to -day, right? like, you, you know, you talk about leadership, you talk about, you know, emotional intelligence and, and, you know, the kinds of things that people need to do to be able to be successful, but lurking behind this for so for way too many people is this, is the substance abuse and whether it's, whether it's, whether it's substance abuse or success addiction, uh, you know, or, you know, the, the maniacal needing to look good, uh, people are suffering from it. So when someone like you shares that, I think it really opens the door for other people to take a look at your life. So I appreciate that. So you did, mm -hmm. you did, so you did this work and, you know, now all of a sudden you're a feel, you're a normal feeling human being. That's I, 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 I remember far from, yeah. far from normal, um, but <laughs> All right, we'll 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 we'll, we'll, give, we'll give you that. I remember I did uh, I did the Mankind Project, uh, which is kind of um, it's a men's group that does uh, an experiential weekend, and then it just it just teaches men kind of the hero's journey, uh, the Robert Bly stuff. Um, and uh, I remember going there and doing some shadow work and carpet work, and uh, you know them saying yelling at me saying get into your body, get into your body, and me being a New York Jew, like I didn't even know I had a body. Right. Like I was all head, you know, when someone said, you know, breathe into your body. I'm like, what? I, br I br everything stopped from the neck down for me. Uh, and when I finally learned to breathe into my body, into my belly, to actually have, you know, have that experience, it was game changing for me. And now every, every time I, I, you know, I have a few clients who are New York Jews, I just have to laugh because I'm like, dude, all right, let's breathe. Let's breathe into your body. You have a whole, yeah. you have a whole other intelligence that you have no, no idea exists. You know, even if you're an athlete, you still, they still don't understand. So it's, it's really cool. But so now you didn't, you did this work and you're, you're making the decision to make a, a serious life change, a, a career change. Had that conversation go with your wife, with your partners, with the, you know, in your world. Well, it was a, you know, the transition from being a full-time institutional investor to a coach was one that to some might have felt like it happened overnight. But it was really like a six year from the moment I read Power of Now and began meditating. Uh, it basically, I guess, like almost seven years have passed since then. But I would say when I, I had a first conversation with my wife, maybe a year or so after I, I got sober and I said, I think I want to be a coach. And she said, oh, you can do that later in life when you retire. You've always wanted She's like, you've always wanted to be a teacher. You can teach and coach. It's like perfect. And I ultimately decided before I actually became a coach, I decided that I was going to leave the firm that I was at for four years. I, I made partner for a firm called RRE Ventures in New York, which was one of the pioneering venture capital funds. And, and the partnership was like incredible to me. But with the case of venture firms, you're ultimately making like a 10 year commitment because it's a 10 year, it's actually even these days as companies are staying private longer, you know, fund cycles are 15 years. And mm -hmm. so if you sign up to be a partner, you're making a long term commitment. And so that was the thing is I was like, I don't feel the love. Like, I like in terms of, like, is this truly what I want to do for 10 years, at least 10 years? And I couldn't say yes. So I'm like, why am I making a commitment if I can't say yes, having been there four years? So I went in and I, 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 I it was uh, March, I want to say it was March 30th of 2017. So for almost four years ago, and I walked in, I, I, I emailed my partners the night before I said, y'all have time. They're like, well, what's going on? And I went in and I told them that I was going to leave. And they said, what are you going to go do? And I said, I have no idea. And so that summer, I took a little bit of time off, um, you know, while I was still there as I was transitioning out. And I did a 10 day Vipassana uh, meditation retreat, silent retreat. And ultimately, out of that, 
I was like, I'm going to have a little bit of time off. Now's the time. Like, I don't know if I want to go and coach full time, but I love the idea. I love the spirit of holding space for people. I love helping those, you know, be able to navigate a range of, of challenges and of course go and, and, and seize opportunities. And so I was like, I'm just going to dip my toe in the water and I'm going to enroll in a coaching course and see where it goes. And, you know, that was call it three plus years ago and I haven't looked back. And so again, it wasn't like, oh, I'm quitting venture to go and, and, and become a coach. It was, I think I'm interested in this. Like I have mm -hmm. like a, an attraction towards it. I'm not sure if I fully understand it. Let's go try it. And, and so I went through that nine month program, 250 plus hours. I started coaching people. The same time I got recruited to go to a, 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 a new firm in New York, but more as like a part-time venture partner. And then they, primary venture partners, which is arguably one of the top seed funds in New York City. And I was there for about 18 months and just ultimately decided I want to go all in on coaching. Um, but again, it was a, it was a progression, right? Like I was dipping my toe in the water. I was spending more time interacting with other coaches. I was starting to serve founders and leaders in an entirely new way. And ultimately was like, yeah, this is what I want to go and do. It's, I feel a lot more energy and excitement around it. And um, yeah, so that's, that, that's a little bit of the journey. That's cool. And, and you know, you have, a, you have a unique perspective on it, you know, from coaching, because you can coach and you can advise because you've been, you know, you focus on, on your core constituency, the people you know, which are founders of, uh, of some of startups. So you can, you can bring your institutional knowledge, your understanding of, you know, what they have to do with your coaching skills. Yeah. And, and I should say that, like, there was, the, I spent a decade in, in venture capital, but I also, the decade previously, was as an operator. So I spent, you know, four years at Microsoft and three years at the craft group who own and operate the New England Patriots and a number of startups. So, you know, I'm able to not only bring that venture experience, but real operating experience as well. So what, what, what are, what are the challenges for founders that you, that you're finding that they're hitting besides, besides the financial, besides, you know, I'm talking about the more humanistic challenges that, yeah. they, that they need help with. I mean, there's so many, there's so many. I mean, um, I think there's, there's obviously interpersonal. Um, so I like to say that leadership happens across like three dimensions. There's first dimension is self-leadership. And, and to me, that's like the inner game. Then there's uh, interpersonal leadership. So it's one-to-one -one, uh, or even like one to a sort of small group leadership team, and then there's organizational leadership. And so I try to think about it along those lines. Um, I would say right now, just because there's recency bias, so it's easy for me to just like very quickly talk about, I, I've been seeing a lot of co-founder conflict and, mm -hmm. and interpersonal dynamics between co-founders is something that that seemed quite a, quite a bit of. Um, also just around like time management and prioritization in terms of like, how do I figure out what I should be spending my time on? That's an, I, I, hold on, we how, lost. you lost me. Yes, we lost you, but you're, but you're back. Let's just make sure we're recording. We are, don't know why it went away. Cool. So you were saying, you were saying time, time management is one of the channel challenges, you know, beside, uh, that they're, that yes. Yeah, exactly. And so what I, said, what I said was I have a book for you because I wrote a book but it's actually, it's about time management, but it really is about energy management like you were talking about. Before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like time, time management is, is one that's been coming up quite a bit, but you know, there's everything from, you know, imposter syndrome and dealing with the inner critic. And um, I mean, it, it, it just every, every day is like a whole new set of challenges. And so I would say like, like, those are the big ones. I mean, I think they're, for those that are pre product market fit, I think there's some like existential questions as to like, holy shit, is this going to work? Um, I think there's a bunch of examples that I've, I've worked through with founders in terms of managing their board of directors and how to prep for meetings and how to deal with investors that are putting on a lot of pressure, um, even down to like, um, 
you know, how do I, how do I just give feedback more effectively? How do I, how do I create more accountability in my organization? So when people say that they're going to do something, they actually deliver on it. I just, I just did a workshop with the senior leadership team of a financial firm. Uh, and we, the whole, the whole, the whole workshop was just on difficult conversations. How do you yeah. make strong agreements? How do you deal with conflict? How do you give feedback? Right. And then how do you hold people accountable? Uh, when they're not living up to the agreements that you made, and you know it's it's interesting that these these skills are just so lacking, uh, and 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 so useful once people have a shared language. Yeah, and and it's interesting. Like right now, I'm working with a gentleman who has built a a really impressive company. Still, relatively early days, but you know, it's so interesting. He, it's very clear that he struggles with conflict. And as a result of it, feedback isn't getting pushed down into the organization. People aren't being held accountable. And it's in some ways, before we even start addressing those, first we have to build his emotional awareness and his emotional intelligence muscles and helping him start to actually feel into these emotions of him not wanting to um and to explore those feelings that are holding him back and and that are holding his company back and so it's just it's it's um you know that that's an, that's just one example that comes to mind but again it's you, you can easily go and advise them on how to deliver feedback but like first it's like how do you actually like get in your body and start to feel it and name the feelings that are actually getting in your way. Yeah, so you know, from, from what you're saying, what I really find really interesting is you're not talking about basket cases. You're talking about high functioning, successful people who have things that are in their way to get to the level that they want to get to. Oh yeah, I mean, founders that have raised 10, 15, 20 million dollars from some of the top investors in the world. Yeah, so so it's like it it, it the, one of the dirty little secrets is we don't talk about these things, especially men. You know, m- most men that I know don't have a lot of friends. They don't have a lot of friends that they'll share their struggles with. So to talk about these vulnerable things that are, you know, when you're already successful, it's it's so queasy, you know, uh, and it's it's tough. And then when you have a coach or when you have someone, uh, a team of people, a peer group that you can actually lean on, it's a game changer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, there, there's another product that we, or that I, that that uh, a friend in 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 I just launched called Tapestry, and it's for co-founders uh, that are relatively early in their in their sort of founding journey story that allows them to come together, and it's a questionnaire and a template that we take them through together. Well, first we do an individual session. And then we bring them together, but it's almost like making this like energetic agreement and contract in terms of who each of them are individually. Why is the partnership coming together? What's their work style? And ultimately, like, how do they deal with conflict so that you're getting out in front of it and you're creating a common language and you're inviting them to have these difficult conversations earlier in a company's life? Dude, that's brilliant. That is so brilliant. You know, I, I, I've been in so many startups that, you know, the first year it's a rocket ship, second year, and then all of a sudden those cracks start to show up. And if you can get ahead of that, the trajectory of the company is unlimited. It's amazing. What a, what a brilliant idea. So I've been all over your, your, your website and all the content that you give away just for free. It's just so valuable. That founder's library is amazing. What gave you the idea to put that together? Yeah, so uh, for for those of you listening, you can check it out at founderlibrary.com, and and basically it it became a, a an unexpected project in focus last year. So around the George Floyd protests, mm-hmm. um, I was talking with a lot of underrepresented founders, and what I realized is that many of them didn't. It wasn't that they lacked the hunger and the entrepreneurial spirit, it was that they ultimately didn't have the access to the same networks, information and resources as those in some of the top tech hubs like San Francisco and New York. So that was the first sort of 
inkling. The second was that um, I would, I, I, you know, have many different clients and that the, the, the gaps in knowledge were, were, were evident, you know, everything from like, how do I actually run an effective team meeting to how do I structure my one-on-ones to any range of topics. And so what happened was I was starting to curate and aggregate a set of articles and resources that I could just easily pass on to my clients. And so that started growing. And finally, I was like, why not just turn this into a public resource for founders? And so we launched in, at the end of July um, a Notion page, you know, basically a very lightweight version of the founder library. And it, the response was super positive. And now what, what the founder library is, it's its own website. We have uh, over 3,000 resources across 18 different topics for founders to go and explore. And so it covers everything from people and fundraising and how to deal with investors to how to bootstrap your business to diversity and inclusion. So it's just become this destination for founders. Uh, and I should say free destination, um, just, just to, you know, put something out in there to help you know, help sort of connect the dots for founders that, you know, want, want help on the journey. Uh, I got lost for like a half hour when I was doing some research this morning and I was like, wait, I, I can't, I can't hang out here. There's, there's so much good stuff. And I'll put the, I'll put the link in the show notes. And I really, awesome. I appreciate that, that, you know, you, the spirit in which you give is, is breathtaking. So I appreciate that you do that. So where can people find you? Yeah, people can find me at, uh, I guess the easiest place is schlaff.me, S-C-H-L-A-F as in Frank, uh, F as in Frank, uh, dot me. So schlaff.me uh, is my blog and my, my personal website. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about my coaching, highoutput.co is, 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 the, is the URL. And finally, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I am fairly active, though I feel like I've been taking a little bit of a pause, a little bit of a break from Twitter the last few weeks, but um, I tend to be pretty active on that platform. I, I, would, I, would, I would recommend uh, that you follow at Schlaf uh, on Twitter. It, you will be enriched by it. So Steve, thank you for taking the time and sharing your story and you know, being vulnerable and real and then you know, what you're doing in the world. I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's just, this was fun. I, I, I always enjoy seeing you, Mark. All right. Thank you. And to everybody else, uh, I love you. I, I treasure your time and attention. Have a great rest of the day.